Hi, I'm Rachel Potter. I'm a professor of modern literature at the University of East Anglia in the UK. And I am a co-editor co of the Literature and Politics Companion. And hi, I'm Christos Hadrianis. I'm a lecturer in English literature at the University of Cyprus. Uh, and I am uh, co-editing with uh, Rachel Potter, the Cambridge Companion to 20th Century Literature and Politics. So politics is a notoriously difficult notion to define. Um, it's often hard to separate from other spheres and discourses, so economics, ethics, psychology, sociology, science. But in, a broad, it's, in its broadest sense, politics affects all cultural production, including, of course, literature. After all, cultural production always exists and participates in a public realm. But certain 20th century texts have been political in specific and direct ways because they are the works of individuals who have been politically active and who channel their politics through their writing. So the 20th century texts that we consider in this companion engage with politics directly, with ideas and movements which have aimed to influence the way a country or a people is governed and with distinct political ideologies. Now, for a long time, I think people have been schooled to think of modern literature's relationship to politics as indirect or obscure, and often to find the politics of literature deep within its unconsciously ideological structures and forms. Modernist writers and literary texts often advertise their autonomy from direct political engagements, a focus that shaped much subsequent literature and criticism. This opposition between literary autonomy and commitment was itself politicized during the Cultural Cold War, when literature was seen to embody polarized ideological positions and was both funded and censored by governments. And in her 1973 foreword to Sula, Toni Morrison registered the ongoing force of that opposition between literary autonomy and political commitment. The conventional wisdom, she said, was that political fiction is not art. And countering that assumption, she made clear that, as she put it, since my sensibility was highly political and passionately aesthetic, it would unapolog unapologetically inform the work that I did. Though this companion gives space to several different takes on literature and politics, I think all of the essays in it take their cue from Morrison's unapologetic political and literary sensibility. So they are focused on the works of individuals who have been politically active and who channel their politics through their writing. So the texts considered in the book are all political in specific and quite direct ways. It's not to say that the writers who, um, did not question literature's relationship to politics, nor that they didn't quite quiz literature's ability to affect politics. It's rather to say that the 20th century texts considered in the volume engage with politics openly, obviously, and directly with ideas and movements which aimed at influencing the way a country or a people is governed and with distinct political ideologies. So liberalism, communism, fascism, suffragism, passivism, federalism, different forms of nationalism, colonialism, apartheid, civil rights, black rights, women's rights, sexual rights, indigenous rights, environmentalism, neoliberalism, 20th century authors wrote in direct response to these political movements, ideas, events and campaigns, and many were activists for or against them. The contributors to the book focus on writers who specifically committed themselves and their literary texts to this kind of political activism. Any book about literature and politics in the 20th century will tell different stories and histories, stories and histories that, of course, no companion, however expansive, could ever capture in their entirety or complexity. So the book, our book, opens with an acknowledgement and a recognition 
that literature, politics, history are not monolithic things, and that the various literary and political events that the book engages with are as interrelated as they are singular, sensitive to time and place, and that they impacted and indeed still do on different people and at different times and places differently. The story, the companion charts, inevitably selective as it may be, is however about literature's political commitments and how literature and politics in the 20th century overlapped but also clashed. The first section attends to the politics of governance, political parties and parliamentary process. The writers focused on in this part of the book were engaged with both the 20th century's big political ideas, so liberalism, fascism, communism, and with political party struggles to take control of governmental power. The initial focus of the book is on European-based political movements and ideas as they played out in Britain. As we move to the 20th century, however, the geographical focus shifts outwards beyond Britain and Europe to consider anti-colonial political activism, anti-racist black politics, the Cold War, Afropolitanism and eco-cosmopolitanism. And so the second section of the companion shifts ground geographically and politically to consider politics in its global dimensions. Here, politics involves the international struggles leading to the end of colonialism, the birth of independent nations and the Cold War, and the political ideas of anti-colonial uh, nationalism, federalism, cultural nationalism, and the state-sponsored literature of the cultural Cold War. The third part of the book alters focus yet again honing in on grassroots political activism with transnational reach and often entailing the assertion of rights. This third and final section attends to the grassroots mobilization and group activism of, among other things, environmentalism, women's rights, sexual rights, and indigenous rights. Our concluding chapter on neoliberalism is interested in the late 20th century's dominant political formation of governance, taking us back as almost in a circle to the book's first chapter on liberalism. Despite sometimes facile interpretations of the historical avant-garde or of new criticism, literature has never been devoid of or autonomous from politics, and literature has never been disinterested in or untouched by politics. To paraphrase T.S. Eliot, no literary text has its complete meaning alone. While we know that literature and politics are connected, the authors in our companion are interested in what it is that connects literature and politics, or what should connect literature and politics. As we argue in the introduction, different approaches to these ends produce distinct understandings of both literature and politics, and reveal different methods, approaches, and ambitions. The end in this companion's title is a short, soft, but powerful conjunction that harbors the hope that literature, art in general, might be able to address and maybe even correct the many injustices, social, political, economic, and environmental. But it is also an end that keeps literature apart and so ensures that literature will continue like it always has to fight one way or another for justice. <laughs>